Micah, you start. I'm starting? Yeah, yeah. Hey, tell them, hey, you got, you got something new yesterday. He's finishing. He said I was, yeah, okay. You... <laughs> Tomorrow? You don't know. I'm talking about the new thing you got first. You be all right, guys? No, this is fun. We're having fun. <laughs> you got a new. Oh, I got a new car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's exciting. We didn't pencil that no, in. We didn't the pencil that in. I just totally said that throw you off. No, why don't you talk about youth, first of all, youth and young adult stuff? Okay. Um, we did talk about me saying this. Um, so, youth and young adult stuff is uh, on the go. It's exciting. Um, somebody said something about the one conference last week. That was amazing. Um, I wish you could all get a little glimpse into what that looks like to have like 4,000 people packed into the Coliseum from all across different denominations, all singing the same songs, praising the same God. That was exciting. And the first night they did this big altar call type thing and they asked people if they accepted Christ for the first time to stand up and like 800 to 1,000 kids stood up. It was crazy. It was like I, my heart, I don't know, I don't feel like that that often, but it was, it was amazing and I just, it was, it was really overwhelming. So that's exciting and it's nice to know God's working. Um, oftentimes you look out at the culture we're in and I think you think, where, where's Christianity anyway? Where's God working anyway? And it's amazing, amazing, amazing for me to be able to come to you and say things like that. That is so encouraging for me and I hope it's encouraging for you. And we've got another mission trip coming up in the summer, Summer Serve, and youth groups coming to a close in the next few weeks, but we're excited to see what's going to happen in the last few weeks of that. But anyway, where, yeah, where, these are exciting things. Micah, where's Summer Serve taking place? Uh, it'll be in the Valley in Nova Scotia. And, and what age group is it for? It's from 12 to? Yeah, it'll be 6 to 12, grade 6. Grade 6 to 12. So if right now I'm in grade 8 and I really want to be part of Summer Serve, yeah, you what make do it, I do? You, no, you make it in. Yeah, you're right. At, yeah, what do I, what do, I do? What do I do? Um, Come talk to me. Okay, good. All I right. Guess. That's all I want. Talk to Micah. Okay, all right. All right. Kind of enough, enough of role playing. All right. All right. Um, just one other, okay, so one other thing. <laughs> okay, you can always so carry on Wes. We should do this more often, we're, actually. It's kind of fun. We're starting, we're starting a new series called Compelled. It's our vision series. We just want to give you a highlight of a couple things that are going to be happening in the next few weeks. Usually at this time of the year, we start to shift down. We start to think about summer. We're all getting excited, and I know uh, we're all looking forward to our time of rest. However, in the next few weeks, we're going to be doing this. Uh, we're going to be having a Compelled to Pray uh, prayer service with Riverview Baptist Church on June the 3rd. Uh, Sunday evening, we're going to be sharing a, a, a sort of a, a prayer time together as they are going to be deciding if they want to become a multi-site of the Journey Church. We as well need to be praying about this because we need to, as a church, vote on that decision as well. So this is all happening all in the next few weeks. Uh, Mike is going to be preaching. Actually, we have Dr. Seth Kroll preaching today at Riverview Baptist Church on this series. Next week, it's going to be Micah over at Riverview Baptist. And then on the uh, June the 3rd, we're going to be, um, I'm going to be speaking as well. But then on the 10th, Micah, I'm going to throw on, on the 10th, okay, so now I'm going to take my opportunity to talk again. Um, I like to have big dreams and exciting things going on in my life. And as I've watched God work in the last few weeks, and as I've watched him work in the year, and since I've been here, I've just been, like I said, encouraged to see the way God's been working. And we have a baptism coming up on the 10th. And I have a dream that we would have uh, 15 to 20 people baptized that day. Um, I'd like to see that happen. And I hope God pushes at your heart if that's um, maybe something you should be considering. So I'm actually going to be sending an email specifically to you if you're one of those people that I think, you know what, you should really, I'm, I'm not going to beat around the bush. This is an important thing to do. It's something God uh, tells us to do. He doesn't ask us if you want to do. So baptism is an important step for Christians. And um, I, want to, I want to reach out to you and I want to really have those conversations with you. So I'm going to send you an email. I'm going to send you my cell phone number and I want you to use it. And if any of you want my cell phone number, you can have it. But I, uh, I specifically want to talk to you this week about baptism and I'm excited about what God's going to do. I just, I'll throw it out there to all of you. Please pray about that. Thinking I think about 15, 20 people to be baptized is something that we can't just let's just let's just hope that it happens on Sunday morning. We wanna we wanna pray about this. We wanna talk to God about this. We wanna discern His will in the whole matter. And um, I really I really wanna put that out there for you. If you're one of those people that should be considering that, um, think about that. And so, please so, pray about it either way. So, Micah, 
if they get that email from you and get, you know, and I, I've read, I've already read your draft of it. It looks really exciting. But let's say they go, I really don't want to talk to you. I'd rather talk to Kevin. Can yeah. I do that? You can. Okay. I, all right. You'd be all right with I don't that? Know why you'd want to. I, uh, all right. Just, just want to know. I've got that more gray options. hair. You don't even have gray hair. There's, yet. there's options. Are you, are you chirping me? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's Baptist platform okay. chirping. All right. All right. I'm going to release you too. Um, thank okay. you, Kevin. That was fun. Thank you, yeah. Micah. All right. Thank you. Oh boy, that's. We just never really know, do we? Um, we are um, starting a new series called Compelled. Now, again, uh, maybe you were one of the three billion people yesterday that watched the royal wedding that took place at Windsor Castle between uh, Harry and Meghan. Um, the, the part that I got excited about, and, and uh, I realized that in the order of service for an Anglican wedding, uh, one of the uh, bishops will bring a what's called a homily to the couple. Um, I, I remember listening to the ones I was around when uh, Charles and Diana were married. I remember listening to that homily. I remember when Kate and William were married, and I listened to the homily by that bishop. But then they brought in a bishop, William Curry, from Chicago, Illinois, from the uh, Episcopal or the Anglican Church in America to uh, bring the, the homily. Uh, I think for a lot of British people, they finally heard what a preaching really was. And uh, the internet lit up, and uh, he, uh, he took off. And uh, one person tweeted among the, uh, actually thousands of others, this preacher is going to win the internet today. Um, now, he honored Markle's uh, American heritage and quoted actually Martin Luther King Jr. saying, we must discover the power of love, the redemptive power of love. And when we discover that, we will be able to make this old world a new world. Love is the only way. Now, the Apostle Paul would agree with that as he wrote so much about love throughout his letters to the church in, in the New Testament time. But he would, I think Paul would also say, and let's go one step further. He would say this love is not simply a self-generated effort to say, yes, we need to learn to love one another but rather it is a divinely experienced love. It comes from Christ, and by faith and grace we receive such love and give such love. Now, we want you to understand, though, that this love of Christ that has the ability to take an old world and make a new world is not just a comforting presence for us. A lot of times we want to know the love of Christ as a place of refuge, and please understand if you're going through a time of sorrow and sadness and grief, as we even think about all those families from the most recent high school shooting in Texas, we would want to pray for them that they would know the love and the presence of Christ in their life right now as they go through such excruciating sorrow. But also we have to understand that the love of Christ is not simply a comforting presence, but Christ's love is also an expulsive force that moves us to be and do things that express the heart of God. You know, over these weeks, before we completely slide into our summer slumber, I want us to seize these moments here at the end of May and the first part of June. Because as we come to the end of a season of ministry, and, and just to let you know that when I think about church calendar and church work as a community of faith, you know, it kind of goes from the fall and into the winter and then into uh, the springtime. And then I recognize that, you know, at the beginning of, of the long weekend and, and Victoria Day weekend, and look, I'm so thankful for such a great crowd that showed up today, but there's a lot of people this weekend that are off tenting or camping or fishing or driving or visiting because it's a long weekend. And this is the first taste of summer, right? The first the first glimpse of it. But before we, we recognize it's a time for rest, and rest is great, I think we also there's so much to give thanks for as we come to the end of another uh, ministry year. Uh, last fall, Micah and Sarah started with us, and we've been blessed with their presence, a whole new chapter. 
Um, during this year, we've seen a lot of uh, 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 movement and new families starting to come in, and we even see new faces today, and we welcome you, and we hope that this is the beginning of a new chapter. For some, it's, it's a coming back time, and we're excited about that. And, and we also know that people are getting ready for brand new chapters in their life as they're looking forward to saying vows or making moves or whatever and moving on in the next steps of life. You know, a lot to give thanks for, an awful lot to give thanks for. But, but as you come to the end of one chapter, right, what happens? Well, this is the way God made us. It's time to say, okay, God, what's next? Where, where are you leading us next? Um, and, and that's what I want us to pay attention to in this, in this message series called Compelled. But I think if we are really compelled by the love of Christ, he's going to make us, he's going to lead us to make big moves. That's what love does. Love makes you make big moves. And, and I want us to be asking this question overall over the next few weeks. It's where is God's love compelling us to be both as individuals and as a church um, in this part of the world so we can touch the whole world? So let's consider where the love of Christ moves us. Well, today we want to start off with this. The, the first thing that the love of Christ does for us is this. Um, the, the love of Christ compels us or moves us to believe in the infinite value of people. I want us to read the passage today, and actually, I'll just to give you a heads up, we're going to be reading this passage, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verses 14 to 21, for the next four Sundays. You're going, to, oh my goodness, we're going to look at the same passage. But actually, we, that's what we're going to do. We're going to just keep looking at it and looking at it and looking at it and kind of chewing on it because we think it has an awful lot to say to us. So, so here we go. So let's just read this through. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Well, as we think about that passage, I want us again to go back to the very beginning where it says we are compelled by the love of Christ. That's the name of our series, Compelled. You know, if you stop and think about it, there's all sorts of compulsions that shape you and me, both from within and without, right? I mean, this is part of life and living. I mean, very practically speaking, there are physical, there are social, there are psychological compulsions that push us, right? And make us move. Uh, Dr. Seth Crow, as we were working on this message with him, he, he made this very interesting observation. He says, you know, I, I read something about compulsions. He said, not too long ago, a group of psychologists who study things like motivation and what compels us to do certain things did an extensive study. And one of the questions they asked in their extensive study with these thousands of people was this. What compels you to get up in the morning? They received quite a range of answers, such as the need to go to work, uh, get the kids off to school, or simply the alarm clock forces them awake. But the most common response to what compels people to get up in the morning was simply this, a full bladder. <laughs> That's the number one reason. If your bladder wasn't full, you'd mostly be staying in bed right now. Now, as Seth said, what does that one little piece of dainty information uh, tell about us? Well, it reminds us that we, we have a range of things in our life that compel us into action. From the biological, which we just talked about, but there's also the psychological and emotional 
For example, nothing is going to stop me from watching Harry getting married to Meghan. I have to watch that royal wedding. To social compulsion, I'm really not into this whole royal wedding thing, but I know everyone's going to be talking about it tomorrow, and I better look, at least I know what I'm doing, so I'll watch at least a little bit of it. To um, marital compulsion, honey, you are going to watch this wedding with me, right? <laughs> all sorts of compulsions, okay, all sorts of compulsions. But the scriptures tell us that we also can experience a divine compulsion. And this makes sense when you realize that once we move into a personal relationship of faith, if you followed with us in the last series in the book of Galatians, there's that very simple phrase that says, we all can become children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. A very simple sentence, but it, it illustrates, though, that once we become children of God, we have the, the God's divine work at, in us. We, the, the Galatians went on, and remember, and said that we can walk by the Spirit or we can walk by our our sinful nature. But if we walk by the Spirit of God, God starts his work in us. The, the, the psalmist puts it this way. He put a new song in my mouth and a, and a deep cry into my heart. Paul here says in this passage we just read, the old is gone, the new has come. My point is, is that when we live by faith in God, we now have this new center point in our soul. And Paul describes that from that center point flows the very beginning of this passage we read that the love of Christ compels us. That's our new compulsion in us. You know, the word Paul used for compel literally means to press against. It's a word that gives the idea that you have this force and now you press this force upon us or within us. And of course, that force is the love of Christ. Now, for those of you who want to be Bible students, the issue is here is that the love of Christ is really multifaceted. It refers to the love that Christ has for others. It also refers to the love we have for Christ. And it also refers to the love that's created in us by the Spirit of God. Remember we read in Galatians, for the fruit of the Spirit is, what's the first one? L love, right. For the fruit of the Spirit is love. It generates love in us. It, it is the first of a whole list of things that the Spirit produces in those who give their lives to Christ. Mary, uh, Murray J. Harris said in his commentary here on this part of Paul's letter, he says, Christ's love is a compulsive force in the life of believers, a dominating power that effectively eradicates choice in that it leaves them no option but to live for God and to live for Christ. Now, the point is, if this is the new divine compulsion that we have as people of faith, and if you're trying to wrestle with the idea of faith, you may, you may be moving ever so slowly and feeling that divine compulsion within you. But as you contemplate this very love of Christ that we talk about that needs to compel us, what happens is it leads us to believe new things. And one of the important things that we start to believe because this love of Christ is compelling us now is that we start to believe in the infinite value of people. If I was to go back to that passage we just read in the verse 16, this is what we see. So from now on, we regard no one, notice this if you're underlining this, no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. You know, Paul's statements reminds us that we can choose to look at others from a worldly point of view. And can I tell you that when you look at other people from a worldly point of view, you often limit them or reduce them? I mean, how do you view others? For some of you, you may view others quite selfishly. Others have value as long as they meet my needs. It's known as the hedonistic approach. Others, you may view them from a position of privilege and power. I mean, if anything, when we watched the royal aristocracy yesterday, that's what we were watching, I mean, as long as everyone knows their place within the social stratosphere and keep their distance and respect, 
we all get along, right? There are those who are at the top of the cake, and then there are those who are the plate, right? You know, others, though, may view people in a simply what we call pragmatic way. I mean, we need everyone, right, in our society to play a role. Everyone needs to pay their taxes. Everyone needs to be working, right, paying into the system. We need everybody. We need everybody in our country. We need everybody in our society contributing. So we value each other politically and economically, but that's about it because that's how we view people. But those are all worldly point of views, and they're not necessarily bad points of view. They're just worldly points of view. But the love of Christ, that that's our divine compulsion now within our souls, it takes us to a deeper place with people. We start to grasp their eternal worth and their infinite value. C.S. Lewis, as you hear me quote over and over every year after year, because he's one of my favorite authors, has written this once in one of his books called The Weight of Glory, and he says this, I, and I love this line, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal, writes C.S. Lewis. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is in mortals with whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, gossip about, and exploit. They are either immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. But please remember, everybody you meet, here or around the world, there are no ordinary people. How does our faith in Christ change how we see others so we see their infinite value? Well, let's just give you a really quick framework. Number one, we first of all understand people have infinite value because they're created in the image of God. In Genesis 1.27, I don't have that verse up on the screen, but in Genesis 1.27, it says, God created human beings in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You know, created in the image of God means that we can say one thing. It connects humanity with God in a unique way that makes us precious in God's sight. If any, from a spiritual pastoral level, if any time I have a problem with evolutionary teaching, it's simply this, is that it removes the divine from people. You see, the Bible tells us that we have this connection because we're made in God's image. And it gives people an infinite value because something of God is stamped on each human soul, separating them from everything else in creation. So believing in the infinite value of people starts when we recognize we're all created in the image of God. But here's the second reason why we have infinite value. And it's right here in the passage we read today, Christ died for all. The fact that people have such a high worth in God's sight is clearly seen when God gives his one and only son to save us. The love of Christ deeply influenced Paul, but it was not just a vague idea of love for Paul, but it was anchored in this conviction that Paul knew that Jesus died for all on the cross, and this was God himself dying on that cross. And because Christ is dying for all, that means all have value, all have worth. Look at, look at those verses again in verses 14 and 15. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And, and again, there's that phrase, and he died for all. Because Christ died for all, that means I can't look at anyone with disdain or contempt. Christ gave his life for that person. You know, believing in the infinite value of people finds deep roots here. Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord, the Savior, he died for all. Your neighbors, your colleagues, your classmates, your enemies, those who gossip about you, those who sing your praises, those of different ethnicities, cultures, and languages, and religions. Christ died for all. You know, I think about one of those worship songs that we sang in the past here in our church life. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me, but I would want to change those lines. I would want to say, amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for, for everyone, the world? But I want to be honest with you for a moment. I may say, wow, Christ died for all. He loves the whole world. But honesty tells me I struggle to love everyone. 
to treat everyone with such love. And I asked the question, how can I truly treat each one with such divine respect? That brings me to our third reason about the infinite value of people. I need a Christ in me POV. And for those of you who like the text, POV stands for point of view. What I'm saying is we all need to see people with the eyes of Jesus. Can I be honest with you? I will never muster up love for others on my own. Oh, I may value some of my family. I may value some of my close friends and associates and those that are similar to me. They're like me. But to believe in the infinite and to feel the infinite value of all people, I have to be honest with you, God has to do a work in me. The old Dave is just too indifferent. But this passage reminds me that God wants to do that new work in me. Because listen, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. See, in Christ, I'm a new creation. And because I'm different, I see others differently. And the more I allow Christ to be my center, I begin to see the infinite value deeper and deeper. I begin to experience, as one commentator says, the expulsive power of a new creation love. And this is what happened to the Apostle Paul. Remember, Paul used to be Saul, and at one time, Saul was holding the coats of Christians that he was executing. And all of a sudden, he met Jesus, and because of Jesus, he had this new love, and he got changed. He did a complete turnaround. He had what we would call a Christ POV. He was a new creation. And if we are going to see the infinite value of people, it starts with an, our understanding of creation. Everyone's made in the image of God. It moves on to salvation. Christ died for all. But ultimately, it's a new identification for us. We have a new perspective. We, we're looking at people with the eyes of Christ. But, but now I just want to ask us this question. How does the love of Christ make us make big moves. You know, the story of God's love to us is a story of God making big moves because of that love. Remember the simple verse in the Bible? God so loved the world that he sent. There's the big move. Jesus so loved us, he was willing to sacrifice his life for us. There's the big move. You know, Jesus was willing to make the ultimate sacrificial act. He died for all. He made the ultimate big move because he saw the infinite value of people. His big move moved us into a new relationship with God. But now here's the question. If we look at Christ and he, we call him our Lord and Savior and his love made him make a big move, the question becomes, what big moves now will his love compel us to do? What's the big move? Are we driven by the love of Christ to make big moves? So here's the question I want to end on the service today. How's the love of Christ compelling you? You know, how are we compelled to show the love of Christ to others? You know, this is a very personal question. I mean, right now, where is Christ's love compelling you in your heart to do, to serve, to share, to give, to forgive, and ultimately to become? Make that part of your prayer each day. Christ, where is your love compelling me right now? And just listen. Let the Spirit speak to you. But that is not just a personal question. It's also a church question. It's a people of God question. Do we have a shared vision that's based on a compelling love of Jesus? And let me ask you this. Do we, as a community of faith... And that's what we're going to be asking every week. How does the love of Christ compel us as a church, as a community of faith? Where does Christ's love move us in relationship to our neighbors, our families, our world that's filled with need and brokenness? And let's be honest, with the shootings again, we know there's evil. You know, as we consider where God's leading us right now, we, 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 feel, we feel that right now there's a big move that God's asking us to consider. Under our church leadership, we've been in these discussions around multi-site for the last year. And we need to make a decision whether or not we want to adopt Riverview Baptist Church 
into our family at TJC. Now, very practically, we're going to make that decision at our annual general meeting on June 14th. That's a Thursday, I believe, correct? And the vision is a powerful vision. If you haven't read the multi-site document, some are already over here by the giving station, grab one. Or go on our website. It's right there digitally. It's in nicer colors, too. But the vision is simply this, that, that through a multi-site relationship, we're going to invite RBC to become our third campus so that they can become a welcoming, neighborhood-based, Christ-centered community of faith so that they are a light within Riverview. Now, I don't know about you, I, 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 I think that vision is a powerful vision to guide us. But here's the question that I want to leave with you today. That may be a great vision to guide us, but here's the point. What's going to compel us to follow that vision, to embrace that vision? What will be the expulsive force that will move us and sustain us? What will it be? Well, can I tell you what it can't be? It can't be fear. It can't be worry. It can't be despair. It can't be about institutional glory. It can't simply be about congregational survival or finding the easiest course of action. Rather, it has to be the love of Christ that leads us to believe that people have infinite value and that we as a church are called to reach out to all. I want to quote Bishop Curry again. And it will be this love that makes this old world a new world. The love of Christ is the only way. You see, when the love of Christ is compelling us, both personally and as a church family, we will change, we will risk, we will serve, we'll become flexible, we won't complain, we can share our concerns and work out problems, but not just complain for complain's sake. Because you see, now we have the love of Christ compelling us. And because the love of Christ is compelling us, we now see what has ultimate eternal worth. And it's not buildings, it's not money, it's not programs, it's not traditions, but it's people. People in this neighborhood people in the Riverview neighborhood, people in the Dieppe neighborhood, people throughout all greater Moncton, throughout all of our country, and throughout all of our world. It's people, neighbors, friends, strangers, enemies. Do you believe this? Let's pray. Lord, I just want to take this moment and pray as we move towards um, being compelled by your love. Lord, let us start within each of our hearts so that we can see the infinite value of people, and that changes us. Amen.